Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first webinar of our series, Nature Inclusive Design. Today, we are delighted to have the presentation of the Belgium Energy Island, a collective early planning for a nature positive contribution in offshore electricity infrastructure. And this will be presented by representatives from ILIA, the transmission system operator in Belgium. Now, the Renewable Green Initiative and the Offshore Coalition for Energy and Nature are hosting this event. And before we start, allow me to provide some introductory words. So who we are, who are we? The Renewables Green Initiative, for those who do not know, is a collaboration of climate and environmental NGOs and transmission system operators from across Europe. We promote the development of environmental sound infrastructure for the integration of renewables. Now, a couple of years ago, uh, we started the Offshore Coalition for Energy and Nature, OCEAN. This was established in 2020, to be precise, and RGI acts as the convener and the moderator of the group. Now, today, uh, the, OCEAN, the coalition brings together 27 organizations, including TSOs, NGOs, and the wind industry, who have joined forces to collaborate on the deployment of offshore renewable infrastructure hand in hand with the protection and restoration of marine ecosystems. Now, um, from like one of the early solutions identified by ocean members is the application of nature inclusive designs. We have actually a discussion paper on essential environmental concepts in ocean. And in this paper, we use a definition that refers to nature inclusive design as options that can be integrated in or added to the designs of an anthropogenic structure with the aim to enhance ecological functioning. Now, there's many different uh, nature inclusive designs measures. And here we have a very simple infographic with some examples identified by ocean members in the North Sea. Of course, all of these solutions need to be considered on site to site basis and this is only a representation of things that can be done and this all of these solutions have inspired the organization of our webinar series which we are delighted to launch today now that's all from my side but before we uh, introduce our speakers for today some housekeeping rules we are recording this webinar and the slides will be available after afterwards in the rgi and ocean websites please mute your mics. And uh, if you have any questions, you can raise your virtual hand or write your question on the chat. We will first go through the presentation by Ilia and afterwards we will open the floor for a Q&A session. So please be patient. We will keep the overview and we'll name you for, so that you can raise your question. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our speakers today. We have Nicolas Beck, Head of Community Relations from ILIA, and Rit Durik, Offshore Community Relations Officer, also as, uh, at ILIA. Now, they're both been working directly in the planning process of the Belgian Energy Islands, and we're very excited to, to hear about their experience. So, Nicolas, please um, go ahead. The floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. So, oh, thank you, Ritz. Um, so, um, Ritz and I uh, will present you the Energy Island project of Elia in the Belgian part of the North Sea. Uh, we are running the process of the preparation of the design of the island, and we will soon introduce a permit request uh, for this island. But we will come back on this during the presentation. And mostly, the goal for today is uh, to look at how we intend to maximize the benefits of this artificial island for nature. Uh, with ambitious climate targets to reach and rising concerns about energy independence, our society is at the beginning of, of a change in the way it produces energy. The quick and extensive development of offshore wind is central to the achievement of the carbonization goals and to the integration of renewables and security of energy supply. Offshore technology for the uh, transmission infrastructure, but also for the wind farms, uh, is becoming more and more efficient. Its design and implementation are increasingly taking into account sustainability 
and uh, respect for the marine and the environment. And so will uh, our energy islands also do. Uh, it is a project with a high attention being paid to its nature inclusive design as from the beginning. And that's the purpose of the presentation of today that we share our thoughts and experience about the first steps of this process. So on the agenda for today, just a few words about Elia and uh, offshore energy in Belgium, then uh, the Princess Elizabeth Island. So what it is about, uh, so that everybody has a good idea or insight in the project. And then the focus will be on points three and four, of course, with what we mean uh, with NATO inclusive design, because I think that there might be some difference in, in perceptions of interpretation at this stage. And also, um, uh, the process that we have put in place to investigate how we can uh, develop neat solution for our energy island. Um, maybe a few words about ALIA to start. So ALIA is a transmission system operator. I presume that almost everybody here in the room knows what the role of transmission system operator is. I will not be so long about it, but then we uh, mainly connect producers and consumers. So we own the cables and the lines. We do not own any uh, production facility, but uh, in the context of offshore um, development and renewables integration, we can say, okay, we connect renewables and consumers. Uh, of course, there is much more than this uh, in the uh, mission of a transmission system operator, but I will take too much time today to, to, to go through all of this, so I uh, propose to, 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 to stay on this. If we look at the ALIA group, just a few words also, we have a unique positioning in Europe with two transmission system operators, ALIA in Belgium and our colleagues, uh, 50 hertz transmission in the northeastern Germany. Um, we are active uh, for some years in the North Sea and the Baltic Seas. We have already uh, connected uh, uh, the commissioning of the first wind farms in Belgium and in Germany. So we have quite uh, experience on this. And also we uh, already built uh, interconnectors with different countries uh, in Belgium, uh, the NemoLink interconnector between Belgium and the United Kingdom. And in Germany, for instance, we also, together with our Danish colleagues uh, of EnergyNet, we also commissioned the first hybrid interconnector between Germany and Denmark. An hybrid interconnector, what is it about? It's a connector between two countries, but on the connector you have uh, a wind farm that is directly uh, connecting and injecting electricity on uh, on the line uh, between the two countries. So this uh, uh, helps to maximize the use of infrastructure in the benefits of society. We also created our subsidiary wind grid last year um, with the goal to um, uh, share uh, the knowledge we have in our uh, known markets and uh, bring uh, expertise to other regions. And meanwhile, we already signed two memorandum of understandings uh, with uh, the uh, United um, with the United States here in New Jersey and also New England. So this is the story going on, but different offshore project projects, as you can uh, see or hear. If we look at the offshore tar targets in Belgium, of course, we are a small country, so, so ambitions are high, also at European level, of course, you also know the targets of Europe for 2030 and 2050. What does this mean in Belgium? We have already commissioned 2.3 gigawatts offshore energy um, in the last decade, and we are busy with the development of additional capacity with a target of 6 gigawatts by 2030 and an increase to 8 gigawatts in 2040. Uh, if we look at the map of the, uh, yeah, there's a schematic map of the Belgian North Sea today for um, electricity infrastructure. On the right side, you see um, different offshore concessions, offshore wind farm concessions that have already been commissioned. Um, and also the small box uh, in black, that is the first offshore platform of ALIA. So we connected the last 
uh, for concessions of the first offshore zone uh, or wave. We connected it to the mainland, uh, and this was um, the first step of the transmission network offshore in Belgium. And this has different advantages by connecting different wind farms via transmission infrastructure instead of own cable to the shore. Uh, we have then, um, I, I apologize because I'm in a building and there is the fire alarm uh, ringing. So I will wait uh, one minute, but maybe I will have to leave. Uh, um, but then we, we connected the first wind farms. Uh, this has advantage because we are optimizing the uh, capacity to the shore. The cables and the reliability of the connection for the wind farms is also increasing. And of course, uh, this is an optimization of the number of cables. And then we can um, uh, have uh, less impact for the environment, of course. And what you see on the left side, this is the new zone. Uh, the Princess Elizabeth zone that has been defined in a very special plan. And um, we, uh, this is in this zone that we intend to build our energy island. Uh, you see the green area on the map, it is a Natura 2000 area, and our energy island will be located outside of the Natura 2000 area, but close to it. So there is also a need uh, to pay special attention to nature. I really apologize, but Rit, if you can take over, because I need to leave the building. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is a view of the marine spatial plan. So this is what we have to work with. Eh? Um, you see that uh, a lot of activities are taking place in uh, the Belgian part of the North Sea. So, um, and uh, what was important uh, for us to define the location of the island is um, uh, we, yeah, it, it was defined in a marine spatial plan that we had to uh, build, build all the uh, trans transmission infrastructure inside the Princess Elizabeth area. So th there's no other option. So this is one uh, important um, yeah, uh, picture to show there. Ah, and Nicolas. Yeah, it was a, <laughs> a false signal. So good news, I can stay. <laughs> Apologize. I'll only just quickly explain the marine spatial plan. Uh, it's the second, uh, the second uh, uh, cycle of the marine spatial planning. We all, uh, in Belgium we all started already in 20, uh, 2014, and now we also already have a second version. So this is, uh, yeah. And can you take over again then? Yeah, of course. It's perfect. Um, so a few words about the project itself, um, so that we know what we are speaking about. So we will build an artificial island dedicated to the transmission of electricity. Um, so um, of course there will be some space left for uh, minor activities, I mean minor at the level of the space that is uh, needed, so not a large scale activity, but we can foresee uh, of course, uh, monitoring for nature or scientific research um, material. Uh, there will be a place for this, but not anything else than the transmission of electricity. That's the first artificial island uh, that is dedicated to, to energy. And um, it's also important to, to notice that this is part of the, um, the Belgian uh, um, recovery and resilience uh, plant and also funded by the European Union in the post-COVID period. Uh, so uh, at the left side of the slide, you see a kind of high level electric uh, scheme. Uh, that's not really an electric scheme for uh, engineers, but you can see the principle of the island. So we will connect uh, 3.5 gigawatt of offshore wind turbines to this island, and then the capacity will be uh, shared to the shore in green. Uh, this will be uh, via the use of uh, alternative current technology to the shore. So these wind farms will be always connected to the shore and for the remaining capacity. Um, so this is 2.1 gigawatt and for the remaining 1.4, we will uh, connect them to a network in HVDC. So high voltage direct current. That is the technology that we also use to connect other countries uh, between themselves. And this is then an integrated or the first steps of an integrated uh, grid uh, in the sea. Uh, 
So this is the conceptual design of the island, just to notice at this stage that our, um, we intend to build the island with concrete blocks, um, concrete caissons that we will uh, fill out with sand. And of course, uh, there is also um, uh, a score protection that is foreseen and the uh, surface that it will take at the, the level of the seabed is approximately or maximum 25 hectares. Uh, we also uh, foresee additional features in the design, like you can see, we have a, a wave protection wall uh, in case the waves have, are too high so that the island uh, will not be overflooded, uh, but we will come back on this. And then at the level of the planning, uh, also an interesting information. So like I told, the island is part of the um, uh, post-COVID uh, plan, recovery and resilience plan. So uh, in this framework, we have also strict deadlines that we need to respect. And the island uh, needs to be built by uh, mid-2026. Uh, we have a construction period of two years or a bit more. I'm looking here on the slide to the black boxes in the middle. So a construction period of 2.2 to 2.5 years. And then uh, just to say over the years 2022 and 2023, we are fully um, occupied with the uh, design phase, of course, and also with the environmental impact assessment. So uh, this year we complete by the end of this year, we are already in December, so it's nearly done. Uh, we complete the environmental impact assessment study for the permit, re permit request, but in parallel, uh, we also wanted to start this year our nature inclusive design co-creation project uh, or trajectory, because uh, this is important to start this as from the beginning, as uh, we will work next year on the finalization of the design of the island and um, uh, we will uh, look at the uh, detailed design with the constructor of the island. And so it will be next year that we will make the choices and the decisions about what we implement and all this can be technically feasible. And so this is an important um, approach in two steps. And this year, this was the study, the study period, uh, period and, and see what makes sense for nature. And next year we will uh, look at it in detail also uh, at the level of the technical feasibility and then start building in 2024. Yes, um, maybe uh, let me then uh, explain a little, bit, a little bit more about the why, why are we looking at um, uh, NID solutions. So when we start a project in the North Sea, uh, it's, it, we will certainly, certainly will be uh, producing um, negative impacts. And in order to make those impacts acceptable or maybe even uh, avoid them, we will have to implement mitigating measures. On the other hand, when you introduce the, this island into the marine environment, it will change the environment um, in such a way that it can all, also um, provide opportunities for certain species and, and those impacts can often be positive. So when we then uh, add nature inclusive designs, then we can even more enhance biodiversity. So it's really the combination of mitigating measures and those nature inclusive designs. With this combination, we should be able to come up with an environmental, uh, environmentally friendly design, construction and operation of our energy island. So that is our goal. Um, on this slide, you can see um, on the left side, some examples of mitigating measures. So um, we have been working a lot already on um, what do we have to do to reduce the impact? Can we avoid uh, valuable habitat uh, areas? Um, uh, also on uh, sedimentation, uh, an important potential impact is potential sedimentation of gravel beds. Um, can we change maybe the orientation of the island, the exact location of the island, the size of um, the shape of the island? So that's all factors that we have been working on uh, already and that we will further develop also. 
Um, so this is um, all uh, something that's included in the environmental impact assessment process and in the appropriate assessment process, and this is ongoing. On the other hand, then we see indeed the nature inclusive design solutions. They can help to restore um, habitats in the area or create new interesting uh, habitats. And then on the bottom of the slide, you can of course see that the, the importance of monitoring. Um, we will be monitoring our um, mitigating measures, the negative impacts, but also the nature inclusive designs that we will include, because of course it's important to see what is the effectiveness of these measures. Um, can we maybe still modify them in the field if possible, or if, if it's necessary, or can we learn for future projects? Nicolas, I think you will take over again, but you're muted still. Thank you. Um, then, of course, constructing an island is an ambitious project, and um, Elia wants to of wanted to say is the opportunity to maximize the positive contribution of the artificial island for nature. Uh, we cannot do this on our own, of course. So we have initiated a process with a group of experts. Uh, it maybe you can go to the next slide. Sorry. Oh, yeah. And so we uh, gathered some uh, experts on voluntary basis. Um, and uh, experts from uh, public institutes, from federal public services, also from uh, NGOs, from universities. And we also um, ask uh, to a moderator to accompany the process. At the beginning of the process, it was our intention or our need to have uh, someone neutral to uh, accompany the process. Uh, at the end, it was much more than this. And this is a good experience that we had of the process. So our partner, Org, um, uh, came with a proposal um, to accompany us not only at the level of the moderation of the working groups, but also with some kinds of expertise with um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the nature, uh, with also the use of space, and that's really a, a great added value. And this collaboration has proven to be very useful because we organized different types of sessions. Um, but between the sessions, our partner, Orc Mantis Consulting, and also Maren About, as you can see above on the slide, they uh, could do some um, research work and some preparatory work with, for the second session. So the sessions were focused on the discussions between participants and to capture the experts' opinions. But really, the proposals that were discussed during the session, it was um, a great work and a great preparatory work of our partner, uh, which acted not only as a moderator, but also as a, a real partner to develop solutions. Um, the key objectives of the process um, is quite simple. Uh, it was to better understand expectation and opportunities with regard to nature inclusive design in the first step uh, that we share a, a common view on what we mean with uh, nature inclusive design and how far we uh, can or should go. Uh, also to build up need knowledge because uh, we, we hear more and more uh, about uh, NID, nature inclusive design, but um, the knowledge uh, still needs to be to be built. And also to uh, work together and to go deep into discussions to find the right combination of needs elements and to optimize the design. We will come back on this. Um, and then if we look at the organization of the sessions, it's just a, a picture where you can see it was also not a big group. It was our choice to uh, not involve too many people so that we had really um, the floor to intensive uh, and constructive discussions with the uh, experts that were involved in the process. Uh, so it was also the possibility for us to take enough time to listen to everyone and to make sure that all concerns and opinions have been taken into account. 
this is quite a heavy slides, but this illustrates a bit the uh, process flow that uh, we have followed. So uh, in the course of, of 2022, we have organized six working sessions um, between the months of March and October. So the work has just uh, finished. And this is the first time that we share uh, the process organization and some conclusions. And um, like you can see on the other part of the slides, we used different materials to lead discussions during the sessions. The first point or the starting point was to define our ambitions. Uh, we took certainly two sessions to discuss about uh, NATO inclusive design ambitions and how high uh, our, our ambitions we uh, we need to be and also to have a common and shared understanding of what we mean with NATO inclusive design. It was very interesting um, because this also created um, uh, the collaboration within the group and uh, this is something we also referred to later in the process when we thought we were too ambitious or to uh, or, 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 or not not uh, ambitions enough, uh, we went back to these uh, frameworks um, of ambitions to to discuss uh, it again. So really uh, nice and useful to start with this step. Also, uh, at the beginning, it was not really clear even for ourselves uh, what we wanted to realize, and it was the opportunity. Uh, to to create the space of discussions we shared or thought as a, a project a promoter in a transparent way and this was quite uh, appreciated by NGOs and uh, other expert groups uh, to uh, be um, involved in the discussions about what we exact uh, need or want to realize um, and so we, we defined this uh, really together uh, this created a, a, a uh, kind of confidence within the group. Then, of course, we had um, these group discussions. We also uh, defined the different needs zones that we want to investigate. We come back on this on the next slide. And then on the, uh, the bottom of the of these slides, you see uh, the sequence that we have followed. We have then defined together with our partner org, and that was that is what I mean. Um, with the, the research work that they did between the sessions. So between the session uh, uh, on the basis of what they captured uh, with experts uh, from discussions, they, they came up with different NID elements that we could implement on the island to fulfill some objectives. Of course, these elements were separated things. And it was also one of the conclusions of the experts that uh, looking at need elements is something nice, but it is more interesting to look at them in a combined way. So the, the statement was really, okay, this element can bring something each on their own, but uh, if we want to capture the full potential of uh, solutions that we can implement, we need to look at ecosystems as a whole and all different elements can combine or can support uh, each other to uh, lead to uh, higher impacts, uh, NATO inclusive design impacts in an ecosystem modus. Um, we tried also during, uh, and this is what you see uh, on the uh, bottom of the slide on the right side. So we combined finally the different NID elements um, there were uh, there was a, a, a survey, a scoring of them, and then we combine them in different need models that we can use as a reference uh, for the discussions that we will have now with the constructor of the island, um, checking this with, uh, among others, the technical feasibility. But then um, this is an ecosystem-based approach. We also agreed during the sessions to uh, get the most inspiration as possible from nature so what we could see in nature and um, we also um, came to the conclusion that uh, when we speak about nature inclusive design that we rather look at uh, simple things that we can combine with a sufficient surface with the hope to um, to lead to great results but not to 
uh, try to focus too much on artificial solutions that will be quite expensive. It was really um, the focus to uh, try to see how we can uh, use spaces in an optimal way, not to have a too big footprint or impact on the marine environment, but uh, optimizing it to uh, have a sufficient uh, nature inclusive design effect. we can yeah yeah so indeed um this uh picture this slide gives a little bit more um explains a little bit more our playing field where can we implement uh, an id solutions on the island there's not too much space because we have of course this electrical uh, infrastructure there but it's certainly around the island so you have the area above the water uh, the intertidal area the, that that's in and outside the the water um, then the subtitle zone and, and of course the seabed. And for each of these areas, we have been looking at what functionalities can an ID have. Eh? But as um, Nicola also explained, um, we haven't been looking at every individual uh, area itself, but also the interaction between different areas and, um, and the interaction with the environment. So really indeed this ecosystem functioning was a really important one. Um, so the need for sufficient, uh, sufficient surface, indeed, that's, that's really important. Um, and quite early in the process, it was also agreed that we shouldn't focus on species, but on habitats. And if we have an interesting habitat, then interesting species will follow. So that was really um, always focused on. Um, we also have, it, have to see it in the bigger picture. Um, this island will be installed inside a wind farm. This uh, wind farm will be excluded from fisheries, from bottom, bottom trawling fisheries. And so um, uh, also in this area, there will be uh, additional uh, conservation measures, um, restoration measures. So the, not only the island, but the, the entire area should really become more interesting. Um, we hope to create an ecological hotspot and this island should fit in all the rest of the, the, the you know, the measures that will be uh, implemented in this area. Um, yeah. This uh, slide gives, um, yeah, lists all the ambitions that we have defined. So this is literally, I will read it all. For me, uh, an important one, uh, one that was often repeated is uh, ambitions in design. Um, the, the need for uh, heterogeneity and complexity. And this is something that in all uh, structural elements we will uh, add into the marine environment, we can look at it, uh, make it more uh, diverse and uh, a lot of species will find their exact uh, place they, they want. So this is uh, one of the really important ones we will have to uh, uh, pay attention uh, for. You can read it afterwards. I, I won't go into detail too much here. Uh, of course, there's also quite a lot of items we will have to take into account when we work further on this. For instance, uh, the surface, uh, uh, Nicola already explained, we agreed a certain footprint of the island um, inside this uh, Princess Elizabeth area um, and adding additional uh, NID solutions. Um, we, we will constantly have to take into account that, that this footprint won't be exceeded. Um, also, the Natura 2000 area in the vicinity. Um, when we add uh, NID solutions, we will um, have to make sure that this won't lead to any other or additional um, impacts on uh, this Natura 2000 area or other uh, important um, uh, gravel beds in, in the vicinity outside uh, the Natura 2000 area too. Um, another point here to discuss is um, we will have to work with a phased uh, approach. Um, when we build the basic structure of the island, we will be able to implement already some of uh, our NID solutions. But then um, when the basic structure is built, there will be still a lot of soil disturbing um, activities around the island for, for several years. So uh, several uh, infield cables and export cables will be pulled in into the island. So, for the NID solutions that we want to uh, install around the island, we will have to wait for the right moment when all these installations, uh, installation activities are finalized. 
uh, and then only um, yeah, implement those. So this is also something that we will have, have to further work on uh, uh, on, on our uh, phased uh, strategy to implement all these different elements. And then, the, of course, two uh, important items also uh, is cost and technical feasibility, of course. Um, this uh, slide gives quite a lot of information. Um, so this is the way uh, how the, um, the work the working sessions were structured so to um, to ease discussions um, so our consultant indeed um, developed different nid models so on the left side you see like the basic the naked uh, energy island and then the, the more pluses come to the nid model the more um, complex uh, our uh, strategy becomes so um, it can be that um, more surface becomes available for certain species or groups of, of uh, species, or that um, additional elements are added onto it. So, for example, um, in the NID plus model, you see for, um, for uh, seabirds um, that the wavefall is designed in such a way that it becomes interesting for uh, birds that like to nest on cliffs. Um, but when you then go to the more complex models, you see that also on the island itself, um, surface becomes available um, and, and is accommodated for certain uh, species that, that like to um, nest on the ground. So that's how uh, yeah, more surface becomes available for these birds. Uh, another example is, for instance, for instance the intertidal area. Um, in the NID plus model, we uh, will provide um, we will install um, some uh, some kind of modules uh, on the vertical wall of the caisson that makes it more interesting for a lot of species to find uh, an interesting place but then when you go to the more complex nid models you see that um, additional structures um, are added to the island at certain areas not everywhere because that, that's not possible but then you really create an inter intertidal area um, obviously, this will also lead to a lot of uh, additional uh, technical ch challenges, and this is something that we will have to uh, yeah, uh, uh, study further on to, to see if, it's, if it's, is this indeed possible and, and is the cost uh, okay. So at this moment, uh, it's not decided what model we should go for, and it's even not the intention to really choose one model, but we can also combine different elements from each model, the, the, it's only this, this way uh, our um, uh, working sessions were structured so we could have something to discuss and, and uh, discuss about um, uh, surface uh, and things like that. Um, yeah, two important remarks. Um, first of all, we really uh, asked our experts to focus on um, what's important for nature. Sometimes we have been discussing technical feasibility um, cost a little bit, but it was not the focus. It was really the focus was we asked them to look for the nature aspect. And the second um, important remark is also the, the hard split between the environmental impact assessment process and the NID process. So, um, we don't expect uh, that the experts that have been participating in this NID process, that they also just like that will agree with everything uh, else, with all other uh, with, with potential negative impacts of our project. So, so this is really split and, uh, uh, and, and respected. So uh, what happens next then, um, as was already explained by Nicola, we will uh, by the end of this year, um, we will be selecting an island contractor and together with him, we will then really go into detail uh, what is technical possible, what's the cost, um, how can we uh, really include these uh, proposals into our island design. So this will be a really interesting uh, further process. And I think, uh, Nicolas. Yes. And this is our last slide, um, so we can jump to questions uh, afterwards. Um, I would like to take the opportunity also of this last slide to, to really thank 
our partner ORC that uh, accompanied us during the process and also all involved experts because the conclusion at the end uh, was that we really delivered uh, great work and uh, from a, a project uh, promoter perspective we also have uh, valuable inputs that we can use in the next phases to work further on the design of our island. So we noted here some um, quotes that we heard at the end of the process when we did a tour of the table to, to see what are, were the feelings of the experts, but the process was really appreciated and and even or mainly because it was not clear at the beginning what we uh, wanted to achieve, but we worked together to define this, uh, like I, I told you previously. And this was uh, appreciated by, by experts. And even when we had doubts, doubts uh, in the room, uh, everybody could express his or her doubts, and we uh, discussed them uh, during the process. Um, from a transmission system operator perspective, it was a trade off for us, uh, really interesting and really valuable at the end, but not always comfortable, I must admit because we uh, had to manage during these discussions the trade-off between what we uh, wanted to reach within the framework of our project, but also um, we had to, to respect and encourage the dynamic uh, within the group to uh, look a bit further than this project also, because when we gathered uh, experts uh, together in a room, of course, uh, we wanted to have uh, the, the, the valuable, valuable input that we now have for our project, but it is also the goal, like we said, that uh, to, to contribute to the knowledge, uh, to the scientific knowledge with regard to nature included design, with regard to offshore infrastructure, and sometimes um, we looked at solutions that make the island mobile um, quite different as from the from the starting point that that we had so is this now feasible like Rit uh, told and explained there there are different uh, models from NIT plus to NIT plus 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 uh, this is uh, really ambitious um, but we had to uh, respect also and we did it to respect in discussions the um, the 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 interest uh, that there was to to go a bit further and also uh, to um, develop the statement of experts and huh? the starting point was also look uh, at the surface and huh? there must be sufficient surface for the for nature and for nature inclusive design and then how we can uh, bring this surface to an extreme point uh, we had this discussion within the group. Um, will we be able or can we go so far in the framework of this project? This is something that we, we need to analyze now, but the, this, this was an interesting trade-off in the discussions because, between the project needs and also the contribution of the, the process to, to uh, scientific knowledge. Um, so from our point of view, really a, an interesting experience that we could share with the involved experts and with our partner. And that is really thanks to the contribution of everybody that we came to this result. Is this your, your last yeah. slide, Nicolas? This yeah. was the last slide or this one for questions. Okay, great. Thank, thank you so much. This was a super, super interesting presentation. It, uh, I'm sure that there's going to be many questions after this. I, feel, I think that this, uh, the last um, takeaways that you mentioned are super interesting because it's exactly what we're trying to do uh, with ocean, right? So the conversation is not always comfortable. Uh, the idea is to bring different positions together and to try to be innovative and bring solutions that can accommodate both energy and nature. So there's already uh, a few questions on the chat. So I'm actually going to be calling those who uh, ask the questions so that they can turn on their cameras and ask their questions themselves. So if they're still here, of course, otherwise I will do them for them. So first, I saw the question from uh, Daniel Bengston. Daniel, could you could you turn on your camera and maybe ask the question yourself? Uh, 
if he's still here. Otherwise, I'm happy to I'm happy to to ask it. So the question reads, I interpret the map as the energy island overlaps with natural 2000 areas. Um, if so, how was the natural 2000 permit motivated? Of course, I think that this is whenever you show when, when you show the one of the, your first slides, when it's really uh, obvious that the proximity of the island um, and the natural 2000 are extremely like extremely, extremely close. So this, I'm sure that a lot of uh, our our viewers now had like this this question in mind. How how was this managed? And Nicolas Ritt, would you who would like to take the question? Yeah. Maybe maybe just to be clear, the island uh, we look at um, we have looked at different locations. We uh, I mean, one of the main criteria was also to locate the island on a sandbank. I do not remember if we have. Uh, uh, set this uh, during the presentation, but for the easy reason that uh, uh, the the water depth is is less, and then we need less material. Also, we need less sand, we need less concrete. So this is also an important um, parameter uh, for the, the the mitigation of of the impact of the island. But that, just to be clear, the island is located outside of the Natura 2000 area. Of course, we are close to it. So in the, during during uh, the the permitting process, we have um, to, to perform an environmental impact assessment, but also an appropriate assessment with regard to the proximity with Natura 2000 area. And this is indeed an ongoing process. So we're now finalizing um, all the, the documentation for the environmental permit application and for the um, application for Natura 2000 uh, authorization. But this will be the process for next year. Okay, okay, yeah, right, that's that's clear. Thanks, thanks a lot for this answer. So I would pass the floor to Tor. Uh, Tor, if you would like to turn on your camera and ask a question yourself, otherwise I'm happy to to do it as well. Yes, I, I will I will try. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Uh, so thanks you for the very interesting presentation. Uh, so my, my question is is uh, related to to I mean you you recognize uh, which I like that the you have the negative and the and the positive impact on the on the marine organism. But how do you how do you quantify it? How do you know what are the negative effects and the positive effects, and that you maybe get a positive net positive at the end? The the negative impacts. That's of course that's something that we will have to define further, uh, and that's something we yeah. We, there have been a lot of discussions about what if we do this or that. And uh, yeah, sometimes uh, we, we also had a look at um, what uh, modeling work have we already been doing? Um, does this fit in? And what we uh, see as, as acceptable, um, for instance, when we increase the size, the, the, the width of the island and things like that. So we have been using information from our uh, environmental impact assessment, uh, yeah, our environmental impact report. But um, as long as we don't exactly know what, uh, what we will have, then, then we can, of course, not, not yet know. But um, for several um, uh, elements, that's, that's the importance of our experts. The, a lot of people were in the room that just know this will work and this we know from experience and it's often not in papers they say we know that this won't work and so that was really the input that we needed to to, to develop this and also really for our case and in, in our part of the North Sea and with this type of building that we will uh, be installing introducing there so it's really expert opinion uh, that was really important for us yeah does it Answer the question. Uh, I, I think I would like to maybe just ask, I mean, do you, is there something you could measure like a number of species of the individual or, or uh, some other? No, no, not really. And, and uh, again, also there, it was like more um, creating the habitat indeed, not the species they will follow and an off surface. It was more, we did have like, uh, um, some people have been uh, looking for numbers also on um, what surface would, uh, would be sufficient and, and also for the different um, uh, areas. So that's something we have been looking at, but not that this will attract this much um, animals, but this can indeed work. This can create a system. 
that's something that indeed has been, and also the expert uh, helped really uh, in this. Uh, so that's that was really useful. That's Great. something Thank interesting. Thank Sorry. That that's something Thank interesting you. because indeed we we will uh, perform some monitoring around above and around the island. And this will, I mean, this is the interest to to contribute to to scientific knowledge to to be able to answer this kind of question in the future. Yeah, thank you very much for that answer. Thanks, Tor, for your question. How to monitor impacts? That's extremely uh, a, a very important concern. Um, I will move to the next question. Uh, Matthew, do would you like to turn your camera and ask the question yourself? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks. Yeah, so I can't turn on my camera. Yeah, it, the question was related to uh, to um, uh, you mentioned that there was a separate discussion between the team working on DNID and then the team working on on uh, the EIA, and I was wondering whether you could explain a little bit this because um, and and related to my question where you promoting uh, birds to colonize the island uh, but how do you manage the risk of collision then that was um we had a lot of, of discussions uh, concerning that um and we also had a bird expert uh, so he could give us a lot of information we discussed uh, well uh, in the end one of the last working sessions, he told us, well, um, probably with the, the, the newest generation of turbines, we don't expect, for in, in our case, too much collision with, um, with the typical birds that we would attract. Uh, but in the beginning, it was a lot more like, uh, yeah, really, really vague. And, and that was interesting to see during the sessions that with having a lot of discussions and they searched a little bit more that we can could really yeah, uh, conclude uh, something in, in the end. So the attraction of birds will probably uh, not cause too much, yeah, like a cumulative impact indeed with, with, uh, uh, with these wind turbines. But indeed, yes, this was, we, we discussed a lot about that. Um, um, and yeah, well, we, we con could conclude that it shouldn't be too much of a problem. And also in function of the uh, spices, huh? so um, I'm, I'm actually absolutely not a bird expert, but uh, from what I remember, we make the distinction between uh, birds that are flying over a long distance, and this will not uh, stop on the island uh, anyway, according to, to experts. And then the question was more for the birds that are uh, flying um, at a lower a lower level than like like Rit uh, said uh, the the new technology of turbines and the distance between the blades and the sea level should be uh, sufficient but this is something uh, we will uh, look at and also uh, there are cable corridors uh, foreseen so maybe we can use the cable corridors where there will be no turbines to uh, to make a way to build a way to the energy island uh, that's something we also uh, looking at. Okay, it's super interesting. And we have another question that is actually related uh, with uh, the bird collision um, issue. Hannah, would you like to raise your question? Okay, yeah, I think that maybe Hannah is not here anymore, but I will ask it for her. Um, so she's asking about the effects of protected species settling on the island. Would that make the construction more difficult? Um, that's really something related to the environmental impact, impact uh, report, uh, of course, um, doesn't have to do anything uh, with the uh, NID, but yes, um, we uh, are um, discussing this in the environment, environmental impact report, um, but during the construction of the island, we don't see too much uh, issues. Um, if we would be building an island more close to the shore, I think it would be more difficult, but yeah, we, we don't see too much issues during a construction phase. Okay, thanks a lot. That's very clear. Um, I think that we have a couple of questions more in the chat and then I see already some hands being raised. Robert, finally, would you like to raise your question yourself? 
Hi, uh, Danny. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Right. Um, firstly, I just wanted to say well done. Um, our, our Prime Minister said at the, the National Conference this year in Ireland that, that we, need a, we need a leap, not a step. Uh, and this is certainly a leap, this, is, this kind of innovation. So congratulations. Um, in, in Ireland, we, we currently don't have any um, offshore substations. We only have one offshore wind farm, but we will be building a huge uh, up to um, up to seven gigawatts of offshore wind in the next seven years. And we're, we're trying to uh, get ourselves up to speed on what nature can and can't be attracted to the offshore substation areas. And so my question is, is bird fouling um, a, a risk that has been raised in relation to the substations on the island in terms of the, the guano from birds um, becoming an issue for the, for the stations? Thank you. Uh, certainly, um, and that's absolutely one of the items that we are at the moment already discussing. I'm discussing it with a lot of, of the engineers, what is possible and what's not, and I try to challenge them, um, but I cannot guarantee that we will uh, be able to let the birds uh, yeah, nest everywhere on the island, but indeed it, it causes uh, health and safety issues, but we are looking at how can we make this work? And, and for me, this is also one uh, important aspect that I didn't mention yet. Um, during the, the, the sessions that we had, we also had some of our um, lead engineers, uh, the project leaders inside the discussions. And um, often that is uh, missing for me because I am um, really yeah, a fan of nature inclusive designs and I know why I, we should be doing that, but not the engineers. Um, and not everyone, of course, but a lot of them, they just don't yet un understand why and how. And, and I had a lot of, of these people uh, in the end, they said, wow, now I understand what you're talking about. And oh, I'm, I'm looking at another way. And that's for me the start to really um, also challenge them. And then they go to the contractors and try to challenge them also. So this, this is for me a really important uh, aspect that to have the engineers involved to but yeah, of course, it takes a lot of time. And so that was for me really good that they took this time and, and, and discuss and be challenged. Yeah, I think we need, the, we need the ecologists to do the nature inclusive design and the engineers to do the nature exclusive design bits, you know. Um, and I'm and, and sorry, just to ask specifically, are bird scarers, bird deterrents, bird acoustic deterrence. Are they part of the design of the substation currently, the outline design? Um, we are specifying it in, the, in, in the, the tender documents, but we don't know yet what and how and where. That's something. So we are quite early in the design still, and that's what, what's important. We are early, we, we can, uh, I cannot exclude bird deterrent systems, um, but uh, yeah. That, that's something that, that's for also next year and, and the coming years to define um, how we, how we uh, yeah, work this out. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Robert, for the question. Um, actually, Riet, you just mentioned, um, Anouk, I will give you the word in a second. I was just thinking um, about the catalog of nature inclusive design elements that, that I know that it was um, put together during the process. Is this available somewhere online for everyone to, to have a look or is, is this something that not, is not publishable? It's, it's not yet available uh, so far because we just finished the process and to be honest, the, the, the report is still being drafting these days. And so uh, uh, the, 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 the documents will be uh, available uh, most probably uh, in the course of the beginning of next year, uh, first quarter of 2023 or something like that. Okay, this will be great because it will be very good to to see all this catalog of elements that you that you put together with ecologists and engineers. Thanks a lot for this. Um, Anouk, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, Anouk Pumartin from BirdLife Europe. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very interesting indeed. I have some just a question regarding 
former question actually on birds because we we talked a lot on birds risk of collision collision and in particular during um, construction of uh, the uh, the energy island and the and the in the park but i wanted to ask if you considered also more long term effects what we call barrier and displacement effect and risk on on birds um and in this context if you also envisage or considered um some solutions outside of um uh, of the energy island and the and the green park in general for example restoration of coastal habitat that could be relevant for the birds that will avoid um uh, this uh, this new infrastructure so thank you very much for your response yeah the the larger picture that's that's um, obviously being um considered by uh, yeah some of the experts that we have been consulting so that's the interesting part um but uh, yeah um a, a lot of these uh, factors we yeah we 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 cannot influence uh, of course but in our environmental impact um, report, um, we had also input. Uh, we we let um, experts perform uh, specifically a study on uh, the impact of this island on birds, and and so we really had um, special uh, attention on on our area, what species will come there. So we really tried to have all the elements available for this uh, environmental impact report to have it to have a good picture. And then again, the same experts also worked on our NID solutions so that we shouldn't indeed create anything conflicting. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Anod, for your, for your question. And I believe that this is the, the last one in the chat. And there, I don't see any further uh, raise, uh, hands raised. If anyone wants to raise a question, please do so now. Um, okay, yeah, Roland from RDI, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Denise. Thanks a lot, Rit and Nicolas, for your very interesting presentation. I was just wondering, uh, because you mentioned that these uh, nature-inclusive potential solutions are, uh, let's say, a complementary approach to the environmental impact assessment. Are they also a legal requirement somehow, or is it a choice of the transmission system operator? to be integrated in this It is not legally required, no. Uh, it's something that, that we see that obviously, and, and well, uh, everywhere in the North Sea you see it, eh? this, this uh, need to work more eco-friendly, and this is one part of it. And we also, in our tenders, looking at um, yeah, CO2, reduc CO2 reduction, things like that, and this is one part of it. This is just the way uh, offshore wind should be developed uh, nowadays. So that's, yeah, uh, that's the purpose of, of the, the process. Thank you. So it's actually um, going, trying to go beyond what is required, correct? So which is yes. extremely important. Yeah, thanks a lot for, for this. Thanks for the question, Roland. Um, I see another uh, hand raised, Anna from RDI as well. Please go ahead. Uh, so yes, thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I have a question regarding marine ecosystems, actually. Um, and you said that you are focused on habitat. And one very often heard critique about this creation of artificial habitats is that they are attracting the animals from their original habitat and they leave their original habitats and ecosystems. So I was interested if you maybe discussed this during your co-creation process with experts or not? No, not really in that kind of way, no. <laughs> um, well, we have been discussing the fact that, yeah, you can create a habitat and attract other species than you yeah, originally intended, but that wouldn't be a problem. That was the thing, but not that we would, yeah, um, uh, yeah, attract the animals from their original habitat. That was not not really a concern. No, it wasn't discussed. Yeah, so interesting for for the second for the second phase for the new planning. Um, very good. So I I believe that these are no, that's not true. There's one more question coming. Please, Elaine, um, you can you can um, turn on your mic or your camera and ask the question yourself. 
Ah, no worries. Okay. She says that it doesn't work. So could you maybe elaborate a bit on what you define as offsetting as mentioned in the slide? Well, the offsetting, it's like more mentioned because that's the typical one of the aspects of mitigating measures and things like that. But um, for the moment, we do, don't see any um, uh, any reasons why we uh, have to compensate really uh, impacts because we're really focusing on uh, reduction and uh, avoiding. Um, so offsetting is it's just mentioned because that's part of the whole process. But um, yeah, we're doing everything possible to um, uh, to to avoid the need for uh, compensating measures. Thanks for, for the answer. Um, Elaine says thank you as well. Great. Thanks a lot. There were a lot of questions. I'm sure that there's going to be many other questions uh, in, the, in the months and years to come. Uh, just something in terms of practicalities. When is the report available, actually, for, for everyone to, to be able to read it and to see all of these different measures that you put together? In the co-creation that's a good question i i cannot give an exact date today <laughs> um because we we first need to finalize the work so um but it it will be available i would say um if i have to say something today to give an id by the end of march it will be available excellent so we look forward to understanding more about this process and of course we look forward about the how, what, and where uh, all of these elements are going to be implemented. Um, thanks a lot, Nicolas and Rit. Um, it was a super interesting uh, presentation. Thanks a lot to all the participants. And I would like to say that the next uh, Nature Inclusive Design webinars, um, webinar is going to take place on the 26th of January. So please stay tuned. It will be shared through RGI and Ocean um, social media and on our website. And um, yeah, I believe that we have a few minutes. Um, we're of a few minutes earlier, but it's uh, it's perfectly fine. We had a lot of uh, interesting questions, and um, we are very happy to to have hosted this webinar and super interesting presentation. Thanks a lot to you both, and thanks a lot to all the participants. You're welcome. And thanks to everybody for the interest uh, in the project yeah. and in the subject. Have a lovely, have a lovely rest of the week.